of Jesus Christ is lifted high. Be my Lord and Savior. Take my life. Thank you, Jesus. Join us today in worshiping Jesus Christ. Welcome to Evangelism in Action. This is Calgary, Canada, a city ripe and ready for the harvest. Street Church has been evangelizing the lost for years on Calgary City streets and God is faithful, moving in a big way. In this episode, you'll get a glimpse of our ministry in action as we worship, serve food to the homeless and lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus said, go make disciples of the nations. And this is something everyone can do by the power of the Holy Spirit in any city. What about yours? Welcome to Street Church. We hope you'll be blessed. Yahweh, Father, I come before you and I ask that you will bind the principalities in this place in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I see people in bondage and I see people afflicted with demons. Lord, I ask that you will set them free, Lord. That they will run at the sound of this, of this horn, God. Lord, I ask for anointing in Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. victory.
Ajuda. beautiful yes amen so right now i you know i just want to get your attention we have the most important part of the day right now 
because Louis is going to share the good news that Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, for sinners. And the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that Jesus died for you. That's what Easter is all about. That although you and I deserve hell, we deserve to die in our sins and go to an eternity in hell. But God made a way for you and I to be saved. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place to take the punishment of God. And then God raised him from the dead on the third day, and he's living today. He is risen, and he's alive today, and he's here right now. But have you responded to his love? Have you received this free gift of God? For you to receive this uh, steak, you must eat it. And it's the same when it comes to Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ to impact you for eternity, to get you into heaven, you must receive him as your Lord and Savior. So right now, I just encourage everyone just to listen to Louis as he talks about Jesus Christ, why Jesus died on the cross, why he was rose, why he was raised from the dead. And then we're going to do the Lord's Supper and remember the shed blood of Jesus and the broken body. Amen. Father God, you said and you revealed yourself as one. I address the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of creation. And the God of the poor, the God of the rich. Father, I ask that today that you would bring your presence here, that you would let your glory fall, and I pray you would not let one heart go here untouched by your conviction. You wouldn't let one heart go here without being touched by your grace, my God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man named Peter. And Peter was a nobody. Peter was a fisherman. Peter was an ordinary person. He wasn't a good-looking man. He wasn't probably a very smart man, and he didn't really have a huge, huge purpose in this world. He lived his life knowing a little bit about a God who was far away and probably didn't concern himself with the affairs of men other than to give them rules. He'd heard of a God that gave rules to mankind and then seemingly left and left them to their own devices. And this is the way that this man Peter grew up. And he was born into the world just like many of us were. Into a normal family, in a normal home. And he looked normal and his, and his life was normal. There's nothing extraordinary about this man. And he had no extraordinary talents. This man named Peter. And I'm going to fast forward and I'm going to tell you how Peter died. Peter, because of a belief that he wouldn't let go of, was put on an upside down stake with a horizontal beam. So he was upside down and his arms were stretched out and through his wrists were about five to six inch nails that attached him to this cross upside down and his feet also were attached by a nail to this cross and he was upside down. And upside down he would take hours to die of asphyxiation and of loss of blood. And this is how this normal man, Peter, died. This normal person who just grew up in a normal home, had a normal family, he found something so powerful that he would die in this excruciating way for. This is a normal person. And this man, Peter, he was one of the followers of Jesus. And Jesus had a few other followers. One of them said, I don't even want to be buried like Jesus was buried. He said, wrap me in... Uh, papyrus, which is basically the equivalent of saying, wrap my body in newspapers and throw me in a tomb because I don't want to die like Jesus died. There was another one who was speared to death. Another one who was given a chalice of poison was put in boiling oil for the faith of Jesus Christ. Why? Because these are men who for the who really saw the crucifixion of Christ. These are men and women who saw what Jesus went through on the cross, who understood 
who understood the cross. It's such a cliche. It's such a cliche. And it would just, it would fill me with joy to see everybody in these lineups who has a cross around their neck to take it and throw it in the garbage. Okay? Because the crosses that people wear around their neck and the way that we wear a cross around our neck like it's nothing and we use it as a piece of jewelry, it's the worst blasphemy we could ever understand. That we would take the most beautiful act in all of history and turn it into a cliché. Jesus died on the cross for you. What does that mean? What does it mean that the Son of God came and died on the cross for sinners? What does that mean? What does it really, really mean at the end of the day? Well, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to start with the human condition. Where are we? Every religion in the world is man's pursuit of God. The only true, true religion is God's pursuit of man. As soon as man sinned in the garden, God said, He said, where are you? He said, where are you? This is God's first words that He said to man from the fall. And I want you to picture this. Some of you have children. And I'm hoping there's somebody who can relate to this. Maybe somebody's had a child that's been ripped away from you and that's been taken away from you. This God of all creation, this God had such a super abundance of love in His heart, such a super abundance of passion in His heart. He said, I need somebody to share this passion with. I need something to share this heart with. So I'm going to make a creation out of my image and likeness. And that's what happens when you have children. You have a little baby out of your image and likeness. That is your family. That's your child. This is a part of you. This is your flesh and blood. And that's what God did. He made a people. He made a creation that were His flesh, that were His blood, that would bear His likeness, that would carry His glory. He created a people that would be a mirror image of Him. And these people lived with God. This creation that we call mankind lived before God in perfection. The philosophies of Nietzsche and other Satan-possessed people. Believe me, the world has told you that you're worth nothing. That a human being is nothing more than a piece of slime that evolved and grew legs. The world tells us that there's no God with a personality. He's just a nameless, faceless force of good in the universe. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God has a personality. God's heart breaks. God's heart cries. God's heart knows more pain than any human being that's ever walked this earth. God's heart is alive. God's eyes see things that our eyes couldn't even comprehend. God is a personality, and God poured His personality into His creation, and His creation is mankind. God poured Himself into mankind. God poured Himself into a creation made out of dirt. That's you and me. That's you standing in the lineup. That's you created by the living God. And we are perfect without one fault in us. We stood perfect before God, and God's heart rejoiced in us. God loved us, and we loved God, and we knew who He was. He wasn't far off. He walked with mankind. And this God, when somebody disobeys God, do you know what happens? God is everything that is good, everything that is just, and everything that is right. So when somebody disobeys God, they don't just disobey an authority figure. They disobey everything that's love. When you reject God, you reject love, you reject justice, you reject righteousness, you reject perfection. This humankind was deceived in the Garden of Eden by a creature called Satan, a fallen creature who wanted to be God. And when mankind, when me and you were deceived, we were ripped from God's hands. As a child is ripped from his mother, we were ripped from God's hands and God's children were ripped from him. And they took on the form of the creature that deceived them. We've taken on the nature of evil. The world will tell you that deep down you're a good person. You're not. Deep down we're not good people. We're evil. We're rotten from the inside out. 
You look at a child, you don't have to teach your child to do wrong. He already knows how to do wrong. You have to teach your child to do right. You have to teach your child to do right. And we've been ripped away from God. And because of that, we have things in our heart that we can't control. Because we no longer have that relationship to the one who created us. We've lost our Heavenly Father. We've forsaken Him. And because of that, we have passions in our heart that we can't understand. We have wicked longings in us. We serve ourselves instead of God. Our heart looks to anything but God for an answer. We've forsaken His way. We've all, like sheep, we've gone astray. And we're in a free fall, every one of us. And we're under God's judgment. And I want you to understand that, that when mankind fell, all of heaven was looking to God, looking to Jehovah. Look what these human beings you created have done. You love them so much, but are you going to condemn these people even if you love them? Picture it this way. A judge has a child that he loves. But this child is a criminal. But this judge is a just judge. What is he going to do? Is he going to let his son go just because it's his son? Or is he going to take the side of justice and bring down the punishment that's due whether or not it's his son? And all heaven looked at God. Is God going to have partiality on man because they bear his image? But if God had partiality on us because we bore his image or because he loved us, he wouldn't be God. Listen to me. Listen, please, because you could die and go to hell in five minutes. You never know. Listen, please. If you are thinking you're going to get to heaven because God loves you, you're not. Because God will not change justice for us. He won't do it. If we have committed a sin against God, He'll punish us based on that sin. No matter how much He loves us, because He's good and just. And He won't throw out justice for our sake, or else God would be just like the devil. And He's not. And we had no way of salvaging ourselves. We were lost in our way. We lost our Creator. We lost our Father. We lost love out of our heart. We replaced our love with sensuality. And we became self-seeking. We became selfish creatures that want nothing more than even if that's at the expense of others. We want nothing more than to satisfy our own greeds and our own wants. And God said that we became an unclean thing. We became not holy. And God is holy. And He couldn't accept us the way we are. So what does it mean when you hear over and over again that Jesus died? That Jesus went to the cross? First of all, let me know that I want to talk about a place called hell first. I want to talk about hell. Because it's a real place. And I want to talk about hell and I want you to understand what hell is. Hell is a place where every evil and wicked thing goes. God has created a perfect place. God's kingdom is perfect. And everything that is not perfect, everything that causes offense, everything that raises its head against the knowledge of Christ will be cast into this place that's called hell, including human beings, if we refuse to be separate from our sin. So God created a place of fire and burning. And right now there's, there's, there's angels locked in this place called hell. And these are angels that rebelled against God and they're forever in chains. I want you to understand that hell is a real place. And that hell is a place, if you've ever been locked in a very dark place, imagine yourself locked in a coffin. Imagine as a live person locked in a coffin. It's dark in there. And you can't move. I remember I played games as a kid, and sometimes you'd be locked in somewhere dark. And you'd start to panic a little inside. But you knew that they'd let you out soon. Hell is a place where you can panic all you want, but nobody's going to come and let you out. It's the truth. And the reason that God created hell, you say, how could God, who is love, create a place of hell and burning where he's going to throw people and they're going to be tortured for all eternity? 
I'm sure many people have asked that question. I've asked that question. And the reason is simply this. is because God is so perfect. And the more you love, the more you hate. Let me explain. The more you love your child, the more you hate what hurts them. The more you love righteousness, the more you hate unrighteousness. The more you love kindness, the more you hate hatred. So God created a place that forever, forever there would be destruction of every wicked thing. Because of God's hatred for sin. Because of God's hatred for wrongdoing. But God's heart, like I said, God's heart feels more pain and feels more love than all the hearts of mankind put together. You say to yourself, how could a loving God create a hell and throw people in it? But your heart is not more passionate than God's heart. Your compassion for those people going to hell is not greater than God's compassion for those people going to hell. God wants those people to be saved more than you do or anybody else. And Jesus Christ was in the bosom of the Father. Jesus Christ for all eternity was the Son of God and He laid His head upon the Father's heart. And it says that Jesus left the bosom of His Father. Jesus Christ left His home. Listen to me, there's a God who loves you. I'm going to go and none is going to go with me. It says in Isaiah that nobody went with them. It says he alone had to stand up in a world full of iniquity, a world full of sin, a world full of God-hating people. Jesus Christ stood alone. Gandhi wasn't with him. Buddha wasn't with him. Muhammad wasn't with him. Jesus Christ stands alone to this day. He's the only one. He's the only way to God. Because everything that you ever did in your life, everything that you've ever thought in your heart that was wrong, everything you've ever carried out with your hands that was evil, every, everything that was ever in your heart that was, that was wrong, that was wicked, that wasn't right, every sin you've ever committed against the Holy God, everything, everything Jesus saw. Yes, Jesus loves people. Yes, Jesus heals people, but Jesus never once winked at somebody's sin. He never once laughed off somebody's sin. Sin is serious. 